topic of the message this morning is what's going on in hell. What is going on in hell? Very seldom do you hear a message preached on hell today. Occasionally you'll hear a preacher mention hell. But to specifically talk about what's going on in hell is almost unheard of from the pulpits across the land. Very little is being said about an eternity away from God. We have friends and we have loved ones who pass this scene of action and they go into eternity unprepared, but yet somehow or another we're able to dismiss from our mind just where they are today. We have national figures. We have political figures who leave this world having lived a life that according to record is a life of iniquity and a life of wickedness and a life of rebellion and a life of rejection of Jesus Christ. But yet somehow or another we never seem to envision them in hell. But the Bible tells me that there are two places, heaven and hell. That if you don't go to heaven, there's only one other place that you can go, and that's a place called hell. Jesus had more to say about hell than any biblical preacher. He had more to say about hell than anybody that you'll read about in the Bible. In Luke, the 16th chapter, we have probably the most classic explanation and the most succinct yet the most detailed of any portion of the Word of God as it deals with hell that you can find. In Luke the 16th chapter, the Bible says this, verse 19, and as you're turning, I want you to look in your Bibles. You that are here in the auditorium today, and you that are listening, I want you to get your Bible down and you check what I'm saying. I don't want you to take what I've got to say about what's going on in hell. I want you to look at it from God's Word. And I've got to believe that all the Bible is inspired. I've got to believe every page of this Bible. I can't just accept part of it. I can't just say, well, I'm going to accept the parts I want to if I accept John 3, 16. I've got to accept Luke 16. If I accept the reality of heaven, I've got to accept the reality of hell. Now look at Luke, the 16th chapter, and the Bible talks about, and Jesus is the one speaking, there was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. There was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Now I want to stop here just a moment. And I want to explain something about the location and the relative location of hell and paradise at this time. Jesus was speaking about an actual account. There are those that would tell you that this is a parable. And since it's a parable, it's not applicable. That it's nothing more than just a fairy tale or just a story. But this is an actual account because proper names are mentioned. And proper names are never mentioned in a parable. But I could go on and on other things. But let me mention this. What if it is a parable? If I agree with you and say, yes, it's a parable, what's it teaching It's still teaching the reality of a literal scorching, burning hell. That's what it's teaching. But before the cross, before the blood was ever presented to the heavenly Father for the remission of man's sins from the time of Adam, when man died, he didn't go to heaven. When the Old Testament saints died, they didn't go to heaven, they went to paradise. Why didn't they go to heaven, preacher? because the blood of bulls and goats could not do away with sin. And sin had to be done away with before anybody that trod upon this earth could go to the holy place called heaven. Sin had to be done away with. And until Jesus presented his own blood to the Father, 
for the remission of sin. Everybody who died, who lived upon this earth, went to paradise. After the resurrection, the Bible talks about Jesus took the captivity, those that were in paradise. He took them and he moved paradise into the presence of the Father. In fact, in the book of Matthew, you'll read where the Bible says that even the streets of Jerusalem were trod by saints that had died before, that Jesus had uh, taken out of paradise and he allowed them to be seen in Jerusalem to illustrate the truth that the reaction uh, or that the resurrection was a reality. So Jesus moved paradise. But at this time, paradise was across from hell, the place of torment. There was a great gulf. There was a chasm between the two. And those that had died in the faith went to paradise. The Bible calls it here Abraham's bosom. That's where they remained until the resurrection of Jesus. And Jesus took them and moved paradise to heaven. That's why the rich man could look across this great gulf and he could see Abraham and he could see Lazarus. Look at what the Bible says. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Now, many of you, your preacher will not read this verse. Many of you have never heard a message on hell, a literal burning, flaming hell. I was preaching not long ago in a church not far from here. And there was some people who came up and I had preached on hell. And do you know what they told me? Here was a young person, 15 years old, that was saved that night and some other young people and when we were talking after service they said preacher we have never heard a message on hell they didn't even know about it but hell's real he said i'm tormented in this flame but abraham said son Remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted, Lazarus is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot. That's the gulf I was talking about. Neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. He said there's no crossing. The people in paradise can't come to hell. The people in hell can't come to paradise. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldst send him to my father's house, for I have five brethren, that, they, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, the Old Testament scriptures. Let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. I think the description that Jesus gives here is clear. I don't believe anybody can mistake the clear-cut language of this account in the book of Luke. There are those that would attempt to bypass it. There are those that would attempt to sort of go around that particular passage of Scripture. But this morning, I want you to know what's going on in hell. And the reason I want you to know what's going on there is so that you won't go there. Number one, the first thing that's going on in hell is something that most people would not expect. The first thing that's going on in hell is something that usually is reserved for those who would be considered to be quite religious. But the first thing that I want you to notice in verse 24 that's going on in hell is praying. There's praying going on in hell. There's more praying going on in hell today than in most churches. There's more praying going on in hell today than here in America. There's praying. Look at verse 24. Here was this man who said, Have mercy on me. Here was a man in hell crying out for mercy. That's something you hear very little of today. 
We used to have old-fashioned mourner's benches in our churches. And the preacher would preach on hell, fire, and damnation. And the preacher wouldn't cut any corners, and he'd come down the middle of the road, and he'd tell you that there was a hell, and he'd tell you there was a place of torment. And then at the invitation, when it was given, the Holy Ghost would convict men and women, and they would come to altars, and they would come to mourners' benches, and they'd get on their knees, and they'd cry out to God for mercy, but you very seldom see or hear that anymore. That's almost a thing of the past. But I want to say something to you today that until you are willing to cry out to God for mercy, you'll die lost. Here was a man that died lost. Here was a man that died without God. And he began to pray when he got to hell. Too late. Yes, too late. But still yet he was praying. And I want to say to you today that there are multiplied millions in hell today at this very moment that's praying. They're praying. He said, have mercy on me. On earth he is too proud to pray. On earth, he was too rebellious. He was going to live his own life. He wasn't going to bow his knee to anybody. He wasn't going to bow to God. He didn't need God. He had all that he needed. He had riches. He had power. He was a rich man, the Bible said. He could buy whatever he wanted and whatever he needed. He didn't need God. He was too proud and he was too rebellious. He was actually too foolish to pray. You know, there's a lot of folk like that today. He could have said what some of you have said in this building. He could have said what some of you have said that's listening to this message right now. And I've heard it over and over again. And I want to mention some of the things that people say today and go right on at a breakneck rate of speed toward hell. There are those that say, well, I'll take my chances. You ever heard that? I'll take my chances. I've talked to people about hell and they say, well, I don't know about that. I'll just take my chances. And I know some that took their chances and they lost. Can you imagine in a game of chance there's always stakes. There's always something that you may gain or you may lose. I want you to look at what you may lose this morning. You may take your chances, but if you lose, you're going to lose your soul. You're going to lose eternity without God. You're going to lose everything. You say, I don't know whether there's a hell or not. I don't believe that there's a hell. That doesn't change it one bit. The Bible said that there is a hell. The Bible says that hell is real. And you may take your chances. And you may have in the back of your mind. Well, I don't know whether there is one or not. So I'm just going to take my chances. You're gambling with your soul, my friend. The Bible says, what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his soul? Some of you are too smart. You're too smart to pray. You're too smart to come to God for salvation. But you're not smart enough to escape eternal damnation. And some have said, I'll tell you, if that hypocrite makes it, I'll make it. Have you ever heard that? Sure you have. If old so-and-so makes it, down at the church house. If that hypocrite makes it, I'm going to make it. But he's not going to make it because he's professing something that he doesn't possess. Some say, you're not going to shove religion down my throat. You ever heard that? Sure. Don't try to shove religion down my throat. I'm not. And I've got news for you. God won't either. If you reject and if you rebel and if you harden your neck, the Bible tells me that you will be cut off. God's not going to shove salvation down your throat. Don't you worry about that. Some of you say, I wish you'd leave me alone. You're going to. We're going to leave you alone. You're going to be left alone one of these days. In hell, ain't going to be nobody going to try to get you to get saved. In hell, nobody's going to knock on your door. In hell, you don't have to worry. You don't have to run and hope that uh, you, uh, turn out the lights and hope that they didn't see the lights when the Christians come to visit you and try to get you to come to the house of God and try to get you to get saved. You don't have to worry about anybody bothering you in hell. I wish they'd leave me alone. God's people are going to leave you alone one day. The rich man, he could have said tomorrow, 
just like millions in hell did. Tomorrow, some other day, but there are no tomorrows in hell. But when he got there, he lost his pride. He lost his rebellion. He lost his foolish conjecture. He lost his foolish rationalization of eternity. And he began to cry and he began to pray. And he said, have mercy, have mercy, have mercy. Would to God he had asked for mercy while he was still this side of the grave. I've got news for you today on the other side of the grave. For you that are lost, there is no mercy. Then he cried out for help. He prayed for help. He said, send Lazarus. He wanted a visit from one of God's children. Whenever trouble comes, that's the only time some folk that are away from God wants to see any of God's people. When they're sick or when the baby's dying or when they don't have a job, they don't call for their drinking buddy and they don't call for their dancing partner and they don't call for the person out in the world. They want somebody from the church to come. But while everything's going good, they better not see you. On earth, he didn't need anybody. And he didn't need anything. Especially Lazarus. Especially that old beggar that was laying out at his gate. He didn't want him in his house. He was dirty and he was filthy. He didn't want him to come in. Lazarus laid at his gate, but he never asked him in. Lazarus was sick, but he never offered any medical assistance to Lazarus. Lazarus was poor, and here was a man that was rich, but he never gave him anything, no relief whatsoever. Lazarus was hungry, but he never was given a meal. Uh, eternity, one of these days, however, is going to turn situations around. It's going to be different in eternity than it is right here. On earth, the rich man had the finest bed to lay on. Lazarus laid on a hard ground. On earth, the rich man could afford the very finest doctors. Lazarus had to depend on the dogs for relief as they licked his running sores. The rich man had wealth. He had stature. He had pride. He had the respect of the community here upon the earth. Lazarus was poor and broken and rejected, a castaway and a cast off from society, a beggar. The rich man ate of the finest utensils China and silver, Lazarus had to eat his garbage. The rich man knew Lazarus, but he didn't have any time for Lazarus until he got in hell. And then he wanted to see Lazarus. He said, send Lazarus! Send Lazarus! Never but the way he asked for Lazarus. One of these days in hell, you'd like to see this preacher. You'd like for this preacher to come and talk to you about your soul. You ain't got any use for me now. You don't want me to come now. But when you get to hell, you'd give 10 billion worlds if I could come. You ain't got any use for those people down at the church house now. No. You've walked past their houses, they've been close to you, they're across the street, they're next door, but you'd rather not for them to come by. But in hell, you'd like to see them. He prayed for mercy. He prayed for help. He prayed for his brothers. Verse 27, after Abraham said, there's nothing I can do. Things are turned around. You were comforted and Lazarus was tormented now. You're tormented and Lazarus is comforted. There's nothing I can do for you. He can't come to where you are. Neither can you come from where you are to where we are. There's nothing that can happen that can alleviate your suffering. And you know what he did then? He prayed for his brothers. He said, would you send him to my father's house? I've got brothers. I've got brothers that's going to come to the same place and I don't want them to come. I don't want them to come. Senator friend, you that are listening to this message right now, there's some people in hell calling your name. There's some people that died and went to hell. Maybe some of your kin folks. Maybe some of your friends. Maybe some of your loved ones. They're in hell right now and they're calling your name in prayer. And they're asking that somehow, some way, the message be gotten to you not to come to that place. The rich man asked for a visible sign. He said, would you send, 
Would you send somebody from the dead? Would you send Lazarus? Would you send, would you send a miracle somehow or another impress upon their mind to get right? But you know what Abraham said? He said, they've got Moses and the prophets. They've got the scriptures. If they're not going to believe the Bible, they're not going to believe a miracle. They're not going to believe it if somebody was brought back from the dead. They wouldn't believe it if they don't believe the Bible. And I'm here to tell you today that if you don't accept what God's Word says, if you don't believe the Bible, you're lost and lost forever and ever and ever. God's done His part. He's given His only begotten Son. He's preserved in a language that you can understand the Bible. And you can understand the way of salvation. And God's given it to you. It's here in the pages of God's Bible. You don't need to wait. And you should not wait for a sign. Or for a thunderclap. Or for an audible voice. No, God's given you the Bible that you can understand. And the way of salvation is clearly plain. And if you don't believe that, then there's no hope for you. You've got to believe the Bible. There's praying going on in hell. What else is going on, preacher? They're screaming. They're screaming going on in hell. Right today. Right now. They're screaming. Matthew 13, 42. Jesus said, there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Matthew 22, 13. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you ever heard people gnash their teeth in pain? Grind their teeth together and shatter their teeth together, gnashing their teeth. The sounds are going to be deafening in hell. If you like peace and quiet, you better not go to hell. In hell, there's going to be a crescendo of sound and noise and screams that are beyond the description of man to tell. It's going to be an awful time of screaming. If you were to die right now, the Bible says immediately he woke up in hell. If you were to die of a heart attack, as some of you may, if a blood vessel were to burst in your head right now and usher you into eternity, and you're unprepared, the first thing that's going to get your attention as you wind up in hell are the screams. The screams. Screams of terror and torture as flames and of the bodies men and women that are there as you hear people as they scream no 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 as you hear screams coming from the swollen tongues and mouths of men and women as they scream for water 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 please give me some water as you hear helpless Hopeless screams and people crying out for help. As I go to the hospitals, as I walk up and down the corridors, and some of you work in hospitals, the thing that bears on my mind, and that's what bothers me more than anything else, is when I walk past the rooms and I hear those inside crying, help me. Help me. Help me. Please help me. There's nothing you can do. And they continue to cry, help me. Help me. But they're dying. And they're suffering. And you've given them all that you can give them. But they continue to cry, help me. And in hell, if you go to hell, you're going to hear that over and over. You're going to hear many women and say, cry, help me. Help me, help me, help me, help me. But you're not going to be able to help them. Because all hope is gone. You're going to hear screaming. Mouths and lips turned wrong side out. Unable to utter audible sounds. We'll grind their teeth together and nice them and wail for the pain. But they're suffering. The sounds of hell will be deafening. Then not only you're going to hear screaming, you're going to hear cursing. You're going to hear young people as they curse mama and as they curse daddy. Who didn't tell them? 
who didn't rear the bride, who didn't take him to church. And some of you that are listening to this message, you're going to have the blood of that little boy. You're going to have the blood of that little girl on your hand because they're going to grow up and they're going to follow in your footsteps to a literal burning hell. And as you, when you arrive in hell, if you go first, they come. The first thing you're going to hear, they're going to curse you because you didn't tell them. You didn't show them the right way. Yes, there's children that are cursing mom and daddy because mom and daddy thought more of their popularity at school than they thought of their soul. Because mom and daddy wanted them to achieve a, a place of worldly importance and they wanted them to have the spotlight. And it was more important that they play little league baseball than it was to bring them to the house of God on Wednesday night and on Sunday night. It was more important for them to excel in the world of sports and, and they were more concerned and, and the parents and some of your parents are more concerned about those things, the things of the world, the popularity of that daughter, the excellence of your young man in sports than you are about the soul and they're going to die and lose their soul and wake up in hell. And they're going to curse you for eternity because of your doing that to them. And there are people in hell that are cursing preachers who didn't warn them of hell. That's why I've got to preach about hell. That's why I've got to warn you. And some of you, you think you're going to heaven. We'll get to that in just a moment and you're going to wind up in hell. I've got to tell you that. I've got to warn you that not everybody that says, Lord, Lord, is going to enter. But those that do the will of the Father. There are those that are cursing preachers who didn't have the backbone, who thought more of their weekly allowance and their weekly uh, paycheck. Uh, they thought more of their position with the church and they knew that if they preached hell, a burning little hell, that they wouldn't be able to pastor there long. And so they sold out, sold out the souls of hundreds of thousands that heard them preach, sold them down the river to an eternity in hell, sold them to a damnation that will never be ceased. Oh, how sad it is that in hell there are those that are cursing preachers because they didn't tell them. There's weeping. A dry, shaking, heaving, weeping, a groaning, a remorse. You talk about insanity in hell, it's going to be there. Mad, miserable cries are heard as the horrors of hell unfold. What's going on in hell, preacher? There's praying going on in hell, and then there's screaming going on in hell. Thirdly, there's suffering going on in hell. Those that tell you you're going to be nothing but a spirit floating around are telling you a lie. Amen. You will have a body. You'll be able to see when you get to hell. The Bible tells me that this man, verse 23, says, In hell, he looked up his eyes. He could see. He could feel. The Bible said, being in torments. He said, I'm tormented in this way. He could feel. He could taste. He said, would you cool my tongue? Would you please send him to drop one drop of water just to cool my tongue? Please, please. I'm tormented. He could hear because Abraham conversed with him and he heard the voice of Abraham. He had his five senses seeing, feeling, tasting, hearing, smelling, you're going to go to hell alive. And you're going to have some kind of body. The body will not be destroyed and the body will not be consumed. You say, well, I believe if I go to hell, I'll be burned up just like that, just like a cinder. It didn't happen here, folk. He conversed. He talked. He was tormented. The flames in hell are real. Jesus said in Mark 9, 44, the fire is not quenched. Revelation 20, 10, it's a lake of fire and brimstone. Luke 16, 24, I'm tormented in his flame. How many of you that are listening to me right now, if you could choose the way you were to die, you'd say, preacher, I want to burn to death. 
If you could choose the way you were to leave this world, how many of you would say, I'd choose death by burning? Not any of you. Not any of you. The most painful affliction that the human body can know is a flame. A flame. A few years ago, I was called to a hospital to see what flames could inflict upon human bodies. The mother called me about two sons. I visited those hospital rooms that day. I've never been the same. Never been the same. As I walked into the first room, I looked at a body that was pink. He had been there long. All his hair burned off. Lost without God. They were in hysteria in the hall. His kin folks. They wanted me to talk to him. But he was writhing. His body was twisting. He was opening his mouth. He was glaring. His mind was gone. As far as any rational understanding of anything I had to say. They were trying to make him as comfortable as he could as they could. But it was just a matter of time until infection was going to set in and he was going to die. Until the infection would set in, he suffered a horrible period of time. I went down the hall and walked in to see a brother who was there in the same condition. As I stood there in the room, as they asked me to come, and as I looked at that sight, as I looked at him as he was choking on his own blood, and as he opened his mouth and he would spit black blood all over the bed and all over his body, where he had inhaled the flames. And he opened his mouth and it was as black as the back on my Bible. His teeth coated with black charred blood. Nothing that could be done. As I left that hospital that day visibly shaken, God spoke to me and said, Garland, you know a little more about how hell is going to be now. And that's the way it's going to be. Bodies that will be afflicted by the flames. This rich man said, I'm tormented in this flame. If you go to hell, your body will be seared and blistered, baked and fried by the flames of hell. The pain will be unbearable as you're scorched and charred. But there is no way that you can have any lessening of the pain. There will be no preaching of the flames because Jesus said, the fire is not quenched. There will be no relief because according to Mark 9, 44, the Bible says, where there one dieth not, and the fire is not quenched, ever burning but never consumed. The stink of burning flesh will sicken you to the stomach. You'll spit up the black blood as you inhale flames only to burn again your lungs and your throat. Every breath you take will be more pain as you breathe the flames of hell. You will suffer an excruciating eternal, ever-increasing pain in a place called hell. Hell is a place of torment. What's going on in hell? There's praying. There's screaming. There's suffering. Last of all, there's remembering. There's remembering. You're going to be able to remember. In the 25th verse, Luke 16, Abraham said, Remember, 
Remember. He told the rich man to recall his days on earth. Remember how it was. And in hell there are those that have walked in this building right here that have died and went to hell. That have heard me preach. That have sat right where you're sitting. And they left this world and they're in hell this very moment. But I want you to know something. They're remembering that service here at Truth Temple. They're remembering every service that they ever attended. Oh yes, you'll remember. There are four things you're going to remember in hell. Number one, some of you will remember the pretense. You remember how you fooled everybody. You fooled everybody into thinking that you were saved. Oh yes. In fact, you fooled everybody so well that you fooled yourself. I mean, you played the part so good. And you told the lie so many times. I'm all right. I'm all right. Spirit of God speak to you. You say, I'm all right. Spirit of God draw you to an altar, but you kept telling the Holy Ghost, I'm all right. I'm all right. People talk to you. You kept saying, I'm all right. And you told the lie enough until you finally convinced yourself. There's a lot of people in hell like that. A lot of people in hell that fooled everybody and they did such a good job they fooled themselves and wound up in hell. You're going to remember the pretense. Some of you in this building, you're going to remember the hypocrisy how you knew deep down within your heart you wasn't right. You knew that. You came to church most every Sunday. And you acted right. And you looked right. And people around you thought that you were right. But you knew deep down on the inside that you weren't right. <clears throat> because see, you knew yourself better than anybody else. You wouldn't act like you do if you were right, would you? If you were right with God, you wouldn't act the way you act. That's true. You wouldn't have the same attitude toward church. You wouldn't lay out a church just for no reason, hardly at all, if you were right with God, and you know that. You wouldn't feel like you feel on the inside if you were ready to die, if you were right with God. You wouldn't think the way you think if you were really born again. The most dangerous thing today in our churches across the land is self-deception. They deceive themselves into thinking that they're going to make it to heaven and they're going to die lost. There's a lot of people who bank their eternal welfare, the eternal destination of their soul on an experience they had several years ago, but they know that they're not looking for Jesus, they know that they're not right with God, they think that as long as they made some nominal uh, acclamation as to what God could do for them, as long as they made some, some particular move toward God a few years ago, that they're going to be all right. But you're not. You're not. I want to read you a verse. I'm saying there's people in hell that are remembering. And they're remembering how they had everybody fooled. And they're remembering what a shock it was when after they closed their eyes in death, they woke up in hell expecting to be in heaven. Matthew 7. Verse 21. Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, it's easy to say, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. 
They're the ones that's going to enter. The ones that are doing the will of the Father. Not the ones that are crying, Lord, Lord. Not the ones that are saying it, but the ones that are doing it. The Bible says not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. I want to ask you a question right now. Are you doing the will of the Father? You say, preacher, I'm not. Well, don't expect an entrance into the kingdom of heaven. Verse 22. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out demons, and in thy name done many wonderful works, and then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. That's what Jesus said. There's going to be song directors, there's going to be preachers, there's going to be singers, there's going to be deacons, there's going to be Sunday school teachers in hell who deceive themselves. Self-deception. Self-deception. In hell there are those that are remembering the pretense, the front that they put up. I remember in a meeting in Tennessee one time, how at the close of the meeting and I, as I gave the invitation, many were coming. And one of the men who pastored a church in the city. It was a citywide meeting. One of the main sponsors of the meeting, he came to the front, fell on his knees. I went down front and I said, may I help you? I thought he'd come to pray for somebody else. But he was weeping. And he said, preacher, I've never been saved. I've preached for years, but I've never been saved. That night he got saved. He repented of his sin. Asked the Lord to forgive him. Expressed the faith in the Lord Jesus. And stood on that platform beside me. And to his congregation, many of his congregation that was there that night. He said, I'm going to say something that's going to surprise you. I just got saved. You say, can a man preach and not be saved? He can. You mean people can be saved under his preaching and he not be saved? God will honor his word. Regardless who quotes it, God will honor it. You better be sure you're saved. Then they're remembering the pride they had. They're remembering how they were too, pride to come, uh, too proud to come down to an altar and get on their knees and ask the Lord to save them. They're remembering the procrastination. They're remembering how they put it off. Again and again, the Spirit of God called. They hated it again. They said, wait, not today, tomorrow, some other time. They remember how they put it on. In hell, they're remembering the pretense, the pride that they had, the procrastination. And then they're remembering the pleas. They remember how they heard preachers weep and cry and beg them not to go to hell. They remember that. They're remembering every message, every invitation, every song, every rejection. They're remembering it all. And if you go to hell after hearing this message, this message will haunt you in the regions of the damned forever and ever and ever. It will haunt you as you remember that this preacher told you about that place. I don't know that you remember the pretense and the pride and the procrastination and the pleas for you to get saved. But you're going to remember the permanence of hell. You're going to remember that this preacher told you, according to the word of God, there's no way out. There's no back door to hell. There's no way you'll ever escape. There's no way you'll ever get out. No hope, no way out, no way out. It's not so bad if you go to the hospital and they come in with the charts and they say, well, 
We found out what's wrong with you. And we believe we'll have a medicine. We believe we'll have a treatment that can help you. You can endure the pain. You can endure the suffering. You can endure for a little while until the medicine takes hold. Until the treatment begins to bring you out of that condition, you can endure the pain. But when a doctor comes in and he looks at your chart and he closes it and he says, I'm sorry, there's nothing we can do for you. It takes on a different light. In hell, one of the most awful things about that place is that when you get there, you know that there's no way out. No hope. No hope whatsoever. I remember back many years ago when I was working for a, a trucking company in Charlotte, North Carolina. As I was sitting in my office one day and there's a lady here that used to work at the same place. We had truck drivers coming in constantly. And there was a truck driver who came in one day and he was ice and white. And he was trembling. And he plopped down in a chair beside my desk. And I said, what's the trouble? He said, I've just seen something that I never want to see again. He said, we were coming from Tennessee. When we came up a wreck, a trailer had started down the mountain. His brakes gave way. He plowed into the side of the mountain. He said, we got out of the truck and we were getting him out of the cab when the cab caught on fire. He said, another truck driver and I were pulling with all our might and said, we got everything out except his ankle, his foot. It was hung. We couldn't get it. He said, the flames were getting closer. It was getting hotter. And he said, cut my leg off. Just cut my leg off. And he said, we took a pocket knife. And we cut the flesh from around his bone, of his leg, till we could see the bone. And said, we were trying to break that bone, and we couldn't break the bone. Said, we were scurrying, we, we were trying our best to get that bone broke. But said, the heat got so bad that we had to run. And we stood on the other side of the road, and we watched that man with blood streaming down his legs. And the fire approaching him as he screamed and cried, Don't let me burn. Don't let me burn. Don't let me burn. And he said there was nothing we could do. There was no hope. And some of you that are listening to this message right now, you'll be crying that in hell if you don't get right. Don't let me burn. But there'll be no hope. What's going on in hell? Praying, screaming, suffering, and remembering. Please don't go to that place called hell. You can go to heaven. You say, Preacher, I'd like to go. How can I? Number one, repent of your sin. Jesus said, Except you repent, you'll perish. Repent. Turn from sin. Secondly, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe in his death and in his burial and in his resurrection. Receive him as your Savior. Thirdly, confess him as your Lord and you'll be saved. You say, well, now how can I do that? If you pray this prayer, Lord, I'm a sinner. I turn from my sins. I believe Jesus died for me. I receive him now as my Savior. If you'll pray that from your heart and confess him as your Lord, 
you'll be saved. After you pray that prayer, you confess him and say, yes, he is my Lord, he is my Savior, I've given him my life. You won't have to go to hell. You can go to heaven.